no one likes anybody that's high and mighty. The idea is to do it, um, do everything with an ecology and um, a congruency. So you're working with everybody for everybody. Politeness goes straight out the window. First thing that goes is politeness and good manners. Why? Because they're stressed out. Guess what happens when people get stressed out? Their primal animal comes out, right? Mm. So they start acting like animals, right? They start shouting, they start getting irate. We need to kind of get in tune with, you know, who are we really? You know, if our jobs are turning us into animals, then do you know what? We need to learn from that and actually uh, figure out, well, how can we, uh, you know, de animalize ourselves and actually start to become kind of more conscious creatures? Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Martial Mind Power podcast. I'm Jatinder Palaha with Sifu Lakloy, and we're going to be dropping some wisdom bombs, and we're going to take a journey and see where it takes us. So, Sifu Lak, how's your week been? And where, give, me, give us an example of where you've had to use Martial Mind Power this, this week in your daily living. <laughs> well, firstly, uh, to answer the first part of your question, um, uh, week's been absolutely amazing. Um, so yeah, it's gone really quickly and, uh, it's been nice, you know, um, and, uh, here we are today getting together to do our, uh, martial mind power podcast. And like you said, drop some more wisdom bombs today. And, uh, so that's all, you know, always exciting and a massive buzz. Um, to answer your second part of your question, where have I used martial arts and martial mind power mindset this week? Well, I have to use it all the time. Um, for example, in my daily professional life uh, in, in the corporate work workplace setting, I have to use it all the time to kind of figure out, uh, you know, there's times where um, you want to do something a certain way uh, and uh, it's not necessarily the way maybe somebody else uh, wants to do that or represent that. Um, so it's really a matter of uh, having a dialogue and a conversation around that, <clears throat> seeing um, what the um, the other party, uh, in my case, uh, an executive sponsor for the project um, that I'm running, uh, how how he wants to kind of represent some information and so on. So it's um, a, a symbiotic synergistic uh, uh, flow that needs to happen uh, rather than me push, push the way I see um, myself doing things and the way I would ideally like to do it. It's really kind of uh, working together in tandem. Uh, and it's a bit like, a bit like being in combat, you know, combat is very much like a dance, you know, you've got to be in harmony with your opponent uh, when you're when you're in combat, because if you're not, then it's very likely that uh, you or your opponent um, <clears throat> at some point are going to clash, um, and uh, you know, you, you essentially um, that would be involuntarily um, the case. So you really want to make sure that when you do do something, that it's uh, it's done with that symbiosis. Uh, so a coexistence. Uh, not, not, I won't, you know, say it's always a compromise. It's understanding where the other person is and then responding appropriately. And that's essentially what martial arts is all about is, <clears throat> you know, your opponent throws a punch. Let's say they throw a punch to your face. Um, you know, you've got some options uh, and those options are, uh, you know, to defend, counter, attack or attack. Um, and, um, you know, you have to make a choice. And uh, if you don't see it coming, you're not aware, you're not awake and you're not present in the moment, likelihood is you're going to get caught up. Uh, so you have to be present in the moment. You have to be aware and uh, you have to be in the moment right there to see everything coming at you and, uh, and then respond. Now, there's two things I always say. There's a reaction and a response. A reaction is your primal response to maybe you also refer to as a knee jerk reaction um, that, that you'd have to something that's happening. Now you want to avoid that and throw that out the, out the door in order to respond intelligently. That means you see it coming and you've got um, um, an unconscious response to that, which is a refined response with a level of intelligence. You have to practice that 
again and again and again and again. So that becomes a subconscious response, right? Becomes second nature and also puts you in the strongest position possible. Uh, And that just takes work. And just not, not something that just comes naturally, right? You have to cultivate it. Everybody that's been great at anything has to cul- has had to cultivate that, um, and it's it's learning to do that. And once you do have that, then you just become better and better and better and better at do it and doing that. So uh, that's how I've been using my martial mind power and the martial mindset this week. <laughs> oh, awesome, man! Awesome. Yeah, I had to I had to dive into it a little bit this week as well. We we did um, a filming gig after a while, and um, so we were slightly rusty. So just had to become present and adapt to the situation and think on the spot as to how we're going to be doing certain things. Yes. So um, I had to practice stillness in that one. <laughs> and and the other thing is, is that <clears throat> I think generally there's a misconception that uh, martial arts is about combat. <clears throat> it's about mm-hmm. violence. It's about uh, struggle. It's about um, pain and suffering. Well, actually it doesn't have to be about that. Because once you cultivated your martial mindset, it's actually about um, um, being free of pain, being free of suffering, because you transcend those lessons. Uh, it's only when you haven't really um, absorbed those lessons and really learned those lessons that you will continue to, to suffer and continue to experience pain. Uh, so, for example, in my uh, circumstances, in my corporate uh, setting for example um there's no pain there's no suffering it's an amicable conversation mm-hmm. dialogue that happens sometimes over email sometimes over the phone sometimes over a video conference and there's there's no angst there's no nothing it's very neutral and easy superfluous conversation and that's it so i hope that helps our viewers and our listeners understand that actually martial arts the martial mindset, what we call martial mind power is about making your life effortless, easy, and buoyant. Uh, and that comes through understanding uh, all of the above pain, mm. suffering, and then transcending that through your lessons to raise your conscious vibration and your uh, inner intelligence. Right. Uh, yeah, absolutely, man. It's like, um, it's like you're saying that the whole kind of discipline side of stuff that you get to practice um, you get to apply it in your life, right? Because there's certain times when you have to do certain things. You have to stand a certain way. You have to be a certain way. And it's that inner dialogue that kicks in. And sometimes you just have to do that, you know, that internal Kung Fu <laughs> with your brain as well. So 100% is something that can be applied in a- any situation, really, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's a wonder, wonder, wonderment of, uh, of the whole thing, the, of martial arts, is that... It's a way of living, yeah. A martial yeah. way, you know. Exactly. Um, the Mandalorian says, "A way." And I know, just, do you know, do you know, this conversation is probably going to go take a different turn because, like you're saying, the martial way that just reminded me of like samurais, right? And when you have the ninjas and all, all the, when you look at the traditional kind of paths that martial arts has come through, and um, how it was, they had like principles and kind of honor codes of honor that they used to live by like yeah. the Bushido code for example as well which is you know about honesty integrity loyalty all those kind of respect and but, um you know these these are things that are, are i don't know sometimes it seem as if they're being missed out in the martial arts world sometimes isn't it i mean when i was younger and I used to do practice martial arts we used to bow all the time like we bow yeah. before we go into the mat bow <laughs> to our opponent bow to and I've been to some classes where they don't do that no more. You know, yeah. you've looked at anything. Oh, that's interesting. That respect side of things that you're taught, that discipline to honor other people. What's going on there? You know, so it's a yeah. interesting dynamic. It's, it's funny you mentioned that <clears throat> because, as you know, uh, I teach uh, Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. Now, <clears throat> Bruce um, Bruce's Jeet Kune Do is uh, it's a, a very freestyle um, approach to martial arts. And uh, uh, although there's, you know, um, foundation of uh, biomechanical techniques that um, that you need to build upon, uh, there is a massive misconception because uh, uh, because Bruce said, you know, it's about um, 
uh, researching your own and adding specifically what's your own, uh, research, doing your own research and adding specifically what you, what is your own, um, um, uh, discarding what's uh, useless and, uh, you know, retaining what's uh, useful. Um, there's a massive misconception that you can just do whatever you want. Uh, and because it's freestyle, that means, you know, all of the, um, um, uh, there's also the the uh, the the reference to Jikando being uh, simple, direct, and non-classical, and uh, the classical element as well also brings into place that <clears throat> because it's um, uh, the the understanding or the misconception people have is because it's non-classical, you can you now no, no longer need to conform to the traditional ways of practicing martial arts, which means, uh, you know, you don't have to go in a bow, you don't have any of this, any of this uh, formality, right? So, so to speak, you don't have any of this uh, hierarchy uh, and it's a bit more kind of free and easy and potentially, you know, there's uh, a little bit more easy on the discipline side. Well, actually it's, that is a whole crock of shit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell you, I tell you why that is. First of all, when Bruce was talking about uh, simple, direct and non-classical, simple meant use the most simplistic movement, which will get you to your opponent uh, as quickly as possible. So your chances of hitting your opponent um, and being successful in incapacitating your opponent is as high as possible. Uh, secondly, um, be direct, use the shortest route possible, which means, again, you're going to get to your opponent as quickly as possible. Again, it is about speed, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third one is non-classical, actually was referring to not about the formality, but actually was referring to fluidity in motion, right? Not being rigid in your motion. It's actually talking about mm -hmm. fluidity. And that is all misconstrued, right? Which uh, I'd like to straighten that record, okay? Uh, straighten that one for the record, should I say. Um, and then the other one where about says, you know, Bruce said, you know, research your own, uh, uh, use what is useful, discard what is useless and add that which is specifically your own. Um, a lot of, I get, you know, quite often get students that come in and want to do whatever they want to do. And uh, that misconception really is, needs to be thrown out the door as well, because really Bruce, like I said, had a foundation of techniques and um, uh, biomechanics. So uh, if I was to uh, kind of be a bit more specific in uh, the angle that he was coming, coming from and uh, everything was built on top of that. So ultimately you had to learn that in order to kind of add, you know, um, uh, understand, you know, the idea of, um, uh, you know, using what is useful is do the things that you're good at mm. and discarding what is useless. Now that doesn't mean throw away the things that you're not good at, because if you're not good at it, you should work on it. Right. Mm. So put it back into this bucket, work on it. Cause you need to understand it. And if you don't understand it, how are you going to be able to combat somebody that's coming at you with the same thing, which you don't understand because you don't know, because you're no good at it. Right. Guess what? You're going to get, you're going to get your ass kicked. Yeah. Right. So you need to understand that. The idea about discard what is useless is there's fundamentally some things that you just can't do. You're not designed to do that, may require a certain amount of flexibility or whatever it might be. And your body's not designed to do it that way. So, okay, then you can park that one, right? <clears throat> you can park that. You can't do that. Okay, fine, right? Um, but then add specifically what's your own. So what is your own kind of signature on it? You know, what is your own kind of uh, unique imprint on the, the way you move, right? Uh, and Bruce Bruce understood this. And I'll give you an example. Is uh, We're talking about uh, personalizing uh, the way you're learning martial arts. And Bruce used to teach martial arts in a very personalized way. So he taught uh, some things to Bob Bremer that no one else, right, <clears throat> in, um, in, the, the, uh, in the, the studentship, uh, during Bruce Lee's, um, uh, Bruce Lee's uh, time on earth uh, had seen, right? And he taught him, and, and Bob Bremer, he was, he was the uh, he was known as the ass kicker of Chinatown, right? He was a big burly bloke, right? And um, uh, Bruce just turned around to him and said, "You know what? Reach over and knock him out." That was it. Simple. He was he was one of those guys. Just reach over and knock him out, type of guys. He wasn't one for dance around and move around. Whereas his sparring partner, although you know from <clears throat> from accounts uh, and from the from his. Uh, from from uh, this uh, instructor's um, students, uh, namely Ted Wong, um, he was one of Bruce's sparring partners, and he 
was a really good mover. So he had a specific focus on the footwork, right? Whereas Bob Bremer didn't, right? And Bob mm-hmm. Bremer was taller, so he had a wider footwork, right? In 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 the uh, what Bruce called the bajon or the the on guard position, right? Which is the, the stance. Uh, as he referred to it. And uh, Ted Wong had a slightly narrow one because he was a shorter gentleman, okay? Uh, so everything was specific and adapted to that person. So adding specifically what you own means there is a personal personalization about things. And we need to kind of bear that in mind uh, when we do talk, you know, uh, really kind of refer to this. And um, coming back to the Bushido Code, <clears throat> um, uh, when it comes to when it comes to the way Bruce taught, Bruce was a stickler for discipline, right? He did not take any shit, right, from students, right? He expected respect, right, to be given to each other amongst the student base. And also the instructor first bows to the students this way, this way, right? Uh, show extending peace and respect, okay? Uh, and it's up to the student to ex- to return it back. Now, mm-hmm. obviously, obviously, if they don't return it back to you, then uh, they're probably not you know, the right kind of student that you want in your environment. Because if you're extending peace and respect and love to your students and they're not giving it back to you, then they're not really willing to learn. So you've got to essentially, uh, as as an instructor, I would dismiss them from class because uh, they would just be um, a poison for the rest of the group. Why? Mm. Because... Um, because they're not honoring one another and let alone honoring the teacher. Um, so there is, there is a sacredity to the uh, teacher and the student relationship. Uh, so that needs to be honored and also to student to student relationship. So uh, discipline is an absolute must. Um, and just kind of, uh, again, on the Bushido code, but slightly off the, the Bruce Lee track is, um, is a uh, Cobra Kai. <laughs> now, now Cobra Kai, as you know, is all about no mercy. And again, that is very anti Bushido code, right? Because mercy is one of the, uh, one of the eight tenants of um, the Bushido code. And that means, you know, show mercy to people, you know, then that, that means you have to have a humility, right? Uh, you have to have some humbleness about that, right? Um, you have to have heart, right? And um, uh, show compassion, to other people. Uh, so it, just to kind of put that into context as well, because there's a lot of uh, things that are kind of uh, Hollywoodized and glorified in that respect. And that, yeah, you know, there's there's a reason for that. And if you if you watch Cobra Kai, if you've seen Karate Kid, you kind of, you can see how the, like, the story starting to build up and you kind of start understanding the backstory about why, why, uh, why uh, J- Johnny's instructor was bitter in the first place right and how johnny kind of ended up that way right and um, and um, and all of a sudden this whole kind of bitter trait kind of kind of ripples you know down through the generations until there's a, an awakening and a realization and uh, so I'm really looking forward to Cobra Kai season four, because that's going to be pretty cool see where that goes because uh, i think that's going to be the unraveling of that element um, and, uh, you know, I think everybody wants, um, <clears throat> wants, um, uh, LaRusso and, uh, Johnny to get together at some point and be the, be the dream team, but I don't know, man, let's see what happens. <laughs> maybe, maybe people don't want that. I want that. <laughs> I know, man. I know. It's, that's 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 so cool, man. I mean, I, j- I just wanted to um, touch on the the Bushido code, because just in case anybody listening is like, well, what, what what is this, right? Um, so I've just brought it up on Google, checked it quickly, so I could just go through it. I mean, the the seven virtues they talk about is integrity, respect, heroic courage, honor, compassion, honesty and sincerity, duty and loyalty. Now, look, if you hear, listen to those, right? What part of that? Can you relate to and say that's just martial arts, <laughs> right? Do you see? Do you see the like the embedded kind of um, mindset, mindfulness of the whole, you know, uh, martial way um, is is based on like what we just said: integrity, respect, courage, honor, compassion, honesty, sincerity, duty, and loyalty. That's insane, right? Is that seven or eight? Um, this one I'm looking at it says seven. But they've grouped two or three of them together. So they say honesty and lo- sincerity, and they're saying yeah. duty and loyalty. Yeah. So you, so you may see it as seven, um, where they do group it together, or you may see it's eight. But either way, the, 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 the pillars are referring to the same thing, um, yeah. even if it's grouped together. 
But you're right, though, uh, JT, because, um, you know, I wrote a corporate uh, wellness program or well-being program based on martial mind power. And uh, it's all based around the Bushido Code. And it's mm-hmm. about introducing introducing the Bushido code into the corporate environment uh, yeah. and ensuring that you honor those, uh, those uh, pillars um, of the Bushido code, because they're really powerful. They're really powerful. Um, I mean, I could share, share them if you want. Yeah. Why not? Why not? I think it'd be good because um, I mean, on this topic, on this podcast, we, we pretty much can go deeper into like some of the philosophical side of the, the martial art element and, the the mindset element of it as well right so you know even though like you said earlier it's not just about bashing people though it's not just about fighting there's a whole whole <laughs> discipline a way of living that comes with it with the whole element of it um while you're looking at that just like share for example the whole samurai thing right this samurai has a sword and the samurai's honor is that he's not going to draw the sword just like that because if the samurai draws the sword he must draw blood right that's one of the codes. So if he does draw the sword, if he doesn't actually use it on anyone, he has to then put it back by cutting his hand or, you know, actually drawing blood on it, which is a form of discipline because that's teaching you not to use these things just nilly willy, you know, to actually have a reason and purpose behind why you're utilizing the martial element of it as a, as a kind of last resort, as a defense mechanism, um, <clears throat> but having mastery over the, that element of it, not to waste it as, as such as well. Right. That's right. And, and you know what, just to add to that as well, uh, the Sikh Guru said the same thing. He said, you know, a Kripan's a sword, right? So he said, if you, if you draw a Kripan, right, um, um, then they say, Dalwar Kun um, Mangdiya, uh, right? In other words, the, the sword, Dalwar, is also another name uh, for a sword. Um, the sword uh, wants blood, right? Mm-hmm. So you have, to, you know, so the key thing is, uh, one of the, one of the, the core teachings there is, is that, you only draw it when you absolutely need to, right? You don't draw it, you know, for showing showing your mates, you know, uh, what a nice sword you've got, and <laughs> right, or or showboating or anything anything like that. Uh, it, it is is uh, a tool uh, for restoring justice, but that also means that right, if you're going to be a justice warrior, then you need to really, really be um, be. Um, uh, a role model and a, a, sim, a symbol for that. And uh, then you have to live by that righteous code. And that righteousness means that it doesn't mean you're rigid. It means you're, you're aware of everything and you adapt to what's going on. And you see, you can see things from every single perspective possible, uh, because if you're not unable to do that, you're always going to have a biased view, right? And this uh, subconscious bias is going to land you potentially um, imposing justice on others uh, and therefore creating an injustice because you'll mm. start to be- become dictatorial or authoritarian in, in your own way and all high and mighty. And no one likes that, right? No one likes anybody that's high and mighty. The idea is to do it, um, do everything with an ecology and um, a congruency. So you're working with everybody for everybody. No, and absolutely. I mean, well, that, that, sorry, it's very hard to do. Absolutely, man. And um, that whole thing what you just said there actually reminds me of um, something I just wanted to share because um, so I, I remember going to one of these uh, talks where um, one of these guys was doing a whole exercise where they were indexing old um, Sikh weapons. Like, um, so just quickly for the views, like there's a, whole, there's a whole tradition of like this saint soldier element um, within the Sikh way of living, right? And but, but the reason I brought it up was because the, the guy was saying that when he was um, indexing some of these um, swords in one of the spiritual places um, that he visited, he was speaking to an elder there. And what the elder said was that when people used to come into the fold to learn martial arts, right, they were never given the weapon straight away. Yeah, they were actually assigned like a teacher. Yeah, like a, or you could say a guru or a Jedi master type thing. They were assigned to them, right? And the whole point was that you spend time with this uh, teacher and any issues you have going on in life, right, to do with whatever life in any way, you're supposed to share it with your teacher so that they can actually tell you, go meditate on this, go do this, go do that. So you can actually build a bit of discipline. It was only when the teacher saw that you were ready and you're actually in control of your mind, they used to give you a wooden weapon, right, to practice with. 
And then when they saw that you were actually able to deal with it, then they gave you a real weapon. So yeah. you see, there's like a whole element of controlling the mind before you are actually given the authority to use these weapons. And this is what martial arts is. Martial arts is a weapon, but it's used in a way where it is encompassed in this saint soldier element, this discipline side of it, which is used for benefit as opposed to just knocking people out. <laughs> and, 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 and all responsible uh, martial arts disciplines have followed the same thing. Absolutely. Bruce, Bruce didn't let any students spar within the first year mm. of learning. Why? Because they don't have the self control. Bruce, Bruce was a, a stickler, like I said, for discipline. He said, he said, if there's no place for you in martial arts if you've got no self control, and ultimately, initially, you need to learn self control before you start um, combating one another uh, in a sparring setting, whether it's controlled or freestyle uh, or otherwise. Right. So um, that was number one. Uh, the mm -hmm. other thing is, I mean, I'm I'm practicing uh, kyudo. Uh, which is the um, uh, Japanese Zen art of archery, uh, mm -hmm. and is um, they were, you know, the uh, samurai, the Japanese samurai used to practice uh, kenjutsu or kendo, which is the uh, Japanese sword. Okay, the you know the art of sword fighting, uh, but then um, the more advanced samurais were taught um, the archery to use um, the bow and arrow, and um, it's it's. Is such a beautiful martial art, but it's highly spiritualized now uh, in the in its in its um, in the way that is taught. Uh, and uh, maybe ancest uh, uh, ancestrally, it was like that as well. But most definitely now, uh, and like with most of these martial arts, they were all buried and you know made it illegal to to to, to learn and to teach um, uh, following the the fall of you know the the different empires um, that utilized these uh, warriors and the arts they're in. Uh, but obviously, you know, the, the arts don't die. Uh, they're practiced secretly and they do, re you know, uh, resurface uh, at a later time. And, uh, you know, now it's come back as a, as a more zenful art uh, rather than uh, uh, an art for, um, for long range, uh, long range, um, um, long range combat, you know, uh, firing firing arrows from a long distance so um and then even then right and even today you're not allowed to handle a bow for the first year right <clears throat> you've got different type of kind of utensils like and uh, tools that simulate a bow right so you can learn the the control and the, the movement and so on you're not wow. technically you're not allowed to uh, get your hands onto a bow for the first year so um there's and that's just to give you an example of three different disciplines we've just talked about there and i'm sure there's many many others that have followed the same thing um mm. and again it's like you said you know uh the uh learning martial arts is about cultivating your skills uh, and weaponizing your 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 body right as a as a weapon right and um, but the thing is the the body is a quite a brutish tool okay uh, and it's the lowest form of expression is physical expression is material expression all right uh, <clears throat> then the when you kind of start to kind of raise your consciousness then you start to become uh, onto a mental vibration Okay, and um, and the mental vibration also uh, um, means that you start to now think or higher a higher state of consciousness. Then you got emotions, right? And again, the emotions can sway the mind very very quickly. So you need to be be able to uh, um, monitor and manage and keep that in check, all right? Again, you're raising your vibration to start to start to again cultivate that as a weapon. And then finally, you got the spirit, okay, which is the highest form of fighting, um, which is. Um, which is now you're using energy, right? <clears throat> and again, you need to raise your vibration even higher in order to cultivate that. So, so when you're weaponizing yourself, there are different degrees of weaponizing yourself. And a very good friend of mine, uh, who's a, um, a Wing Chun master, um, uh, once told me, he said, there's uh, three ways of fighting, right? You can fight physical to physical. You can fight physical to energy and you can fight energy to energy okay <clears throat> and um it changes the game and mm. uh, he demonstrated this and honestly it blew my socks off right and uh this this guy is no shrinking violet you know he's not all foo-foo you know he's he's 
he's he's a he's won so many so many competitions uh, and he's still got it and uh, he's he's just a, a a voracious warrior but at the mm-hmm. same time he's super spiritual super intelligent and just a real humble human being a uh, wonderful human being um and um so when he showed me the difference you actually realize well actually you know what when you fight with energy right when you fight with uh, spirit actually a physical stunts no chance but you need to cultivate it. And you're not going to get anywhere close to that until you work your way up that stack because working your way down the stack is a way that used to be traditionally taught, but that's been lost. Um, And, uh, uh, you know, it's practiced um, in some corners in the world, uh, which, you know, uh, will take a bit of time to come back. And the reason for that is we live in a self-gratification instant gratification society, right? We want self-gratification and we want it now. Right. Mm -hmm. And no one wants to put the time in. So all all, the only focus is what can you tangibly get your hands on right now? This this minute within the first three minutes of of placing your order, you know, everyone thinks everything's McDonald's, you know, and follows follows by a drive through mentality. And (laughs) and life's not like that. Right. You know, you're not going to wish something and in three minutes it's going to appear. Right. Uh, Obviously, if you go for fast food, yeah, you're going to get that. But it's fast food and it's full of shit. Right. Um, So if you do want something in three minutes, it's going to be full of shit right <clears throat> uh, so so yeah order away if you want if that's what you want but if you want to put the effort in it and you want to get some gold out of it you got to you got to spend time on it you got to spend time on it uh so yeah but i wanted to kind of uh, go over the um the um bushido code so yep, um, absolutely. in the bushido code i wrote a corporate well-being program which is based around uh, eight tenants right so eight key tenants and um the reason i say eight is because there's eight characters in the Bushido code, okay? Uh, and uh, the, each of these eight characters are unique, right? So uh, this was my take on applying the Bushido code in a corporate environment. So this is basically a corporate environment is any corporate office type of setting or any kind of corporation, any kind of company where you, you know, um, you've got uh, employees. It could be even a kind of industrial organization, right? It doesn't really matter, but any or any 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 kind of company where there's a, collective of people that are working together um in some kind of um some kind of arrangement okay and um so we start off with number one which is restitude or justice um and i, I i've written here on uh, my program bushido refers not only to martial restitude um uh, rest rectitude sorry <clears throat> uh, but to personal rectitude rectitude or justice is the strongest virtue of bushido a well-known samurai defines it this way rectitude is one's power to decide upon a course of conduct in accordance with reason without wavering to die when it is when to die is right to strike when to strike is right another speaks of it in the following terms rectitude is a bone that gives firmness and stature. Without bones, the head cannot rest on top of the spine, nor hands move, nor feet stand. So without rectitude, neither talent nor learning can make the human frame into a samurai, okay? So um, you've got to have justice. You've got to do things the right way when you need to do them the right way, all right? And that means that means you've got to have some structure in there, right? So you've got to have structure in your corporate environment. You've got to, <clears throat> you've got to be firm uh, at certain times, right? And it's knowing when to do it and to do it in the right way, okay? Uh, number two is courage. Bushido distinguishes between bravery and courage. Courage is worthy of being counted among virtues only if it's exercised in the cause of righteousness and rectitude. In his Analects, Confucius says, perceiving what is right and doing it not reveals a lack of courage. In short, courage is doing what is right. Now, quite often uh, in a workplace setting, you know, people choose to take shortcuts. Why? Because they just want to give the impression that they've done the job, not really necessarily done it right. Okay. Lack of discipline. (laughs) <laughs> absolutely <clears throat> but to do it right means that you gotta you gotta pluck up the courage right to put the extra effort in you gotta pluck up the courage to maybe um challenge people um to also also um 
um, uh, align themselves with you and also influence people and persuade people to align themselves to do it with you the right way. And to do it the right way usually takes a little bit longer, usually costs a bit more. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> as a consequence, um, uh, in, the, in the long term, it will cost you less. Why? Because um, the less things that will go wrong, because the, whatever you're producing will more likely be of a higher quality, uh, will have probably less blowback, right? And um, and the ramifications in due course, which means that you know the the um, the investment over. Uh, uh, a shorter term rather than over a longer term, right? And uh, I'm in the software industry. So if you take shortcuts in software and it affects quality, guess what? You're going to have ongoing issues, right? Which are going to draw out your cost over a longer period of time. Mm-hmm. So uh, they, you know, one of the, one of the, one of the um, uh, biggest statistics in uh, software project management is that something like 70 to 80% of project cost is maintenance, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Whereas actually, if you invested more of your time in uh, proper, um, proper um, uh, analysis, design, development, and testing to ensure that your core product had a high quality, then the maintenance would be lower or negligible. Okay. Uh, that means flipping it around the other way. So you want to eighty percent, right? In in those stages, and only twenty percent in your maintenance. But that brings down the cost a lot because the maintenance would, wouldn't be carried over a longer period of time. But just, mm-hmm. just to give you an idea, <clears throat> uh, number three, benevolence or mercy. So this is a Cobra Kai point I was talking about earlier. A human invested with the power to command and the power to kill was expected to demonstrate equally extraordinary powers of benevolence and mercy. Love, magnanimity, magnanimity (laughs) affection for others sympathy and pity are traits of benevolence the highest attribute of the human soul both confucius and mencius often said the highest requirement of a ruler or leader of people is benevolence i mean you know you've got to have mercy on people you've got to have compassion fall under that as well right that is all compassion it's all compassion isn't it hmm that's amazing, right? Yeah, and, and the thing is that, you know, um, some people think that love is the highest vibration. Actually, it's not. The highest vibration is compassion because it's beyond that, okay? Right? And um, love love uh, is usually misconstrued as, um, uh, as, a, as a romantic emotion, okay? Um, and, um, but, you know, there's also um, a kind of a, a friendly kind of love and a sibling kind of love and uh, a, a parenting child kind of love and, and so on. Uh, Synchronicity of complementary opposites. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Compassion, on the other hand, is, is, um, is, is seeing you in everybody, right? And having that um, that connection with every single sentient being, not just with people, but every single sentient being and Mother Earth, and uh, and 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 as a consequence of that, uh, you start to feel that with compassion, they are part of you, and you're part of them. And when you start feeling compassion, then if you do anything and you hurt the other person, you have a realization and awareness that you're hurting yourself too. Right, so you treat the Mother Earth badly. Guess what? That's going to come back on you, and that's happening right now. We're ruining our oceans. We're ruining, our, we're, we're ruin, ruining the land. We're ruining our air. And guess what? It's all coming back to us. We're getting sick. People are getting cancers, and again, all sorts of diseases and so on. Forget about the pandemic. Right? The biggest virus on this planet are human beings. Right? That's the the real pandemic. And who's addressing that? <clears throat> Is there a double jab for that? Well, we haven't talked about that. And let's fucking track and trace that shit, right? <clears throat> um, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? So, you know, we have to have compassion, but that compassion means that we need to see things from a higher higher state of consciousness, right? Um, uh, whatever we're looking at. Um, number four, politeness, okay? And this is discerning the difference between uh, obsequiousness 
and politeness can be difficult for casual visitors to Japan, but for a true human, courtesy is rooted in benevolence. Courtesy and good manners have been noticed by every foreign tourist as distinctive Japanese traits, but politeness should be the expression of a benevolent regard for the feelings of others. It's a poor virtue if it's motivated only by a fear of offending good taste. In its highest form, politeness approaches love. All right. So again, politeness never killed anybody, right? And it doesn't cost you to be polite. It just means that you have to learn to be polite, right? <clears throat> and, uh, uh, you know, again, they say good manners don't cost you anything uh, and courtesy doesn't cost you anything. But guess what? Not everybody is courteous. Not everybody has got good manners. Not everybody is polite, uh, which means that, uh, people will frown and uh, be repelled away from uh, such behaviors. So um, it's something to be be mindful of. If you want to, uh, if you want to attract people and you want to attract abundance, then uh, then the best place to start is by uh, practicing the art of politeness. It's crazy though, isn't it? Because you see so many people are just forgetting these little simple simple truths, simple things like politeness, kindness, courtesy. It's like what what is this? it doesn't cost you anything to do any of those things no. do you know what i mean and no. people just seem to be stuck in this weird thing and just they're angry they're upset they're venting you know it's just it's just weird it's like just tap into the kindness send out some kindness you might get it back <laughs> and, and, and in the corporate environment you know think about politeness man you know where people get stressed out politeness goes straight out the window first thing mm. that goes is politeness and good manners why because they're stressed out guess what happens when people get stressed out their primal animal comes out mm. right so they start acting like animals right they start shouting they start getting irate okay <clears throat> and there's no no excuse for that it just shows a lack of lack of self-control and uh really we need to start to cultivate that that's all this is all self-mastery and 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 the higher the higher stages of that is all all self-realization and uh we, we need to kind of get in tune with you know who are we really you know if our jobs are turning us into animals then do you know what we need to learn from that and actually uh figure out well how can we uh, you know de-animalize ourselves and actually start to become kind of more conscious creatures mm-hmm. right conscious creatures now there's a wisdom bomb for you yeah um and uh so how do you do that so you've got to work on yourself you've got to work on yourself you've got to recognize all the things that are making you unpolite okay <laughs> right <laughs> right and then start cultivating it because that's that's what self mastery is all about that's what martial arts is all about martial arts puts you in the face of uh, face of um uh, adversity right there's nothing 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 worse than um, your first ever sparring session you'll feel those butterflies you'll feel yourself you'll want to go for a piss you know you might want to go for a shit right because <laughs> because all your organs your bowels and everything just want to empty themselves so that your light is possible to to um to fight or flight uh, but if you don't know what you're doing, most people freeze. Okay, and uh, and if they don't freeze, oh, that's a that's a that's another wisdom born there. You said you want to lighten yourself, right? So imagine what the mind can do if it was light of this burden. Exactly, uh, mm. it won't just light, lighten itself; it would enlighten itself. <laughs> <laughs> right? Boom! <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, and this is it. This is it. Uh, but are you aware that you're unpolite? And if you are, then what are you can do about it? Because I guess what, when you put in that first firing session, all that unpoliteness will come out in an instant. And then you've got to learn to actually cultivate that. And the most unpoliteness that will happen is between in your own head and body, right? Mm. Your head will say do, to do one thing and your body will do something completely different, nothing at all, right? Because it doesn't know, right? And that's what you need to do is know. How do you know you need to learn? How do you learn you need to go to someone that can teach it to you? You've got to go to a teacher that's got politeness in order to teach you politeness. You can't learn politeness from some a rude bastard. I'm sorry, but you won't, right? Uh, so if you're going to some egotistical, narcissistic maniac, they're not going to teach you politeness. <laughs> you might be polite naturally. You might have been brought up with politeness, but you're not going to learn it off a teacher that isn't polite. Okay, so you need to go to someone that can show you that way if you haven't seen it before. And if you have seen it before and you are naturally inclined that way to bring more out of it out, then you need to do that. Okay. Uh, Number five is honesty and sincerity. So true samurai, according to author Nitobi, uh, disdained money, believing that humans must grudge money for riches hinder wisdom. Now, that's an interesting one. Humans must grudge money for riches hinder wisdom. 
Thus, children of high-ranking samurai were raised to believe that talking about money showed poor taste and that ignorance of the value of different coins showed good breeding. Bushido encouraged thrift, not for economical reasons for so much as for the exercise of abstinence. Luxury was thought the greatest menace to manhood and severe simplicity was required of the warrior class. The counting machine and abacus were aboard. Now that's interesting, right? So honesty and sincerity, and there's a direct correlation, right? To um, not having um, uh, a financial motivation all the time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And not for not having that financial greed all the time. Now, obviously, uh, you know, uh, in the, in the, um, society we live in we've been taught economics i think economics is the most evil subject out there right and i tell you why because everything economics teaches you is profit based okay aim for profit 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 right now look at our society right now right we are operating right our governments our leadership right are operating society and countries right by a through a balance sheet mentality guess what <clears throat> We're all suffering. Why? Because now, if nothing satisfies the balance sheet, nothing is done for free. Nothing is done out of compassion, right? Nothing is done out of that, that, but, but that, the, the third point, benevolence or mercy, right? Everything has to satisfy some financial uh, motivation. But life isn't like that. This is why one of the biggest things that the biggest treasures that we've got in the UK is our NHS, right? Because we care for people, right? You know, you don't go there and the doctor says, oh, but, you know, what are you going to give me? Are you going to, you know, uh, you know, uh, lace my palm with some money before I mm -hmm. treat you, right? As in some other countries where, you know, you've got to show the money, right, before they can even treat you. Right. There's none of that mercy or benevolence uh, anymore. Right. But NHS, it's it has that. And that's the whole premise upon which it's built. And look at the pandemic. Look at all the wonderful NHS workers. Right. What they did. Right. To look after people. They put their own lives at risk. Right. Um, you saw pictures of um, these doctors and wonderful nurses and uh, hospital staff that uh, were wearing masks. And, you know, they had so many indentations on the face when the, when the masks were switched long hours. You know, they look absolutely exhausted and wrecked. Right. But they did that out of benevolence. Right. They did it because guess what? Something woke up inside them and they thought, do you know what? Fuck this, right? Now is the time for us to rise and look after one another. And they, they stepped out of their comfort zones and stepped into the face of the pandemic, into the face of the virus to help people. I mean, that is fucking balls, yeah? That is, ben that is benevolence and mercy at its peak, yeah? Uh, and you know what? The nation recognized it. And guess what? The fucking government didn't even give them a pay rise, right? The first time around. That is disgusting, right? Why? Because it's a fucking balance sheet issue, right? It's economics. And this honesty and sincerity is all based around uh, grudging money. Why? Because you need to understand that life isn't always about a transaction. Sometimes we have to do things because we have to do them and there's nothing to be gained in return. It's a give situation only, right? So we need to wake the fuck up, man. Oh, and, and we have to, because if we don't, guess what? We're going to carry on like this and we're going to start continue ruining the planet, ruining uh, societies and so on. And, you know, it, it just goes on. And, you know, you just need to look around and see what's happening in the world. Right. It's right in front of our faces. Right. It's not even being hidden at all. So. So, yeah, you need and, to um, just to just just to um, a little bit of emphasis on that, just just in case somebody's listening out there thinking, well, I run a business. You can't be telling me something like that. That's not what Lax is alluding to here, right? When you have a business, there is a fair exchange going on. There's a service being exchanged for something which allows you to build that, live your life and all that kind of, that's not what the conversation here is about. This yeah. is about when the greed kicks in. And this is about when the, 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 the elements that Lax has been talking about have been ignored, all right? And it just becomes about pure profit and things like that. And you just become another number on the balance sheet, as Lax was saying, that's what this whole conversation is about. And I'll, I'll give you, a, I'll give you a wicked example, right? <clears throat> there's, um, there's, um, there was a study done uh, uh, around um, how organisations were run in the north, 
and the South in the in in, in the UK, right? <clears throat> so there's something called the um, the uh, the Watford Gap, which is the Watford Gap is uh, a kind of an invisible line where anything north of that is referred to as Northerners, anything mm-hmm. south of that is referred to as Southerners, right? And they start to look at um, companies in the South uh, versus companies in the North. Now, when they talk about South, they were specifically kind of focusing around London, to be fair. And they were, f- and then when you start looking about North, obviously anything north of the Watford Gap, which is kind of um, Midlands uh, and upwards, right? And what they found was in in London, for instance, specifically London, um, organizations would, uh, if they were... If, organ- if certain departments or the whole company wasn't doing well, they'd look at the balance sheet, see which company was bringing in the least money, right? Um, or see which department uh, wasn't performing so well, and they'd just ca- cut it. Right. So they just lay off people. Right. Um, now, the thing is, uh, <clears throat> the, the the departments that were that were performing well uh, held up the rest of the company. Right. Um, but, uh, so they kept those because on the balance sheet looked like uh, a profitable, profitable uh, manipulation of uh, essentially a spreadsheet. OK. Uh, with um, a formulaic approach to looking at that uh, in the north. Right. What they generally found was that organizations, when they started to struggle um, financially, they they put it out to the uh, the employees to take a pay cut. Right. Uh, so that they could um, they could ease uh, some of the financial burden that they were going through and see everyone through that because they felt a sense of responsibility for the families that the employees um, were supporting as well. Right. Mm. Uh, rather than massaging a spreadsheet and uh, you know an, an accounting view of the world, they actually looked at real people uh, and the impact they were having on their lives and their their livelihoods, uh, which include their families, children, elderly, and so on. And um, what they found was there's one particular organization um, which I write, wrote back in, wrote back in, wrote about in a Master Your Life book, um, which is a beautiful story about how an organization actually asked um, asked uh, people to um, uh, to take some un- unpaid leave. Okay, and uh, if um, if 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 people um, couldn't afford to do that, then they could buy unpaid leave of other people, right? So the people that needed the money could uh, stay in work, and the people that didn't need the money could then take more time off. For instance, so they could swap the unpaid leave, and what they found was they saved much more money than they expected to by doing that. Um, and the people that, um, the people that needed more money um, ended up continuing working so that they, they could, they could earn, earn what they needed. And that the people that were earning enough or more than enough uh, actually decided to take more unpaid time off. Um, mm. And, uh, and it all balanced itself out and they all did that voluntarily. Why? Wow. Why? Because they, the company cared cares cared for them, so they cared for the company, right? Whereas in the south, um, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm in uh, the, the uh, finance industry. I'm in investment banking, and uh, the IT systems around that. It's not like that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if something doesn't doesn't look right on a, from a balance sheet and an accounting perspective, it just goes disappears, right? They don't care, right? Uh, and uh, you know, you've all heard the saying that you know you're you're nothing but a number. Uh, unfortunately, some organizations, that is the case, all right? And in these metropolis com- com- companies, uh, which have a very capitalistic kind of a view, unfortunately, that is the way they operate. Um, whereas in the north of England, for instance, uh, or, or, or the north of the UK, um, it's slightly different, right? The way, the way it's approached. Uh, a very good friend of mine uh, runs a, a fantastic company. And you know what? Uh, he's been offered to be bought out many times uh, for uh, tens of millions of pounds, and he's refused. And the reason he's refused is he's like, I've got an obligation to uphold and upkeep the livelihoods of my employees. And he goes, I'm not going to sell out. He goes, I've got enough. I don't need to sell out. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and I won't sell out because one, he's been born and raised up, up in the North and he's got that mentality. And that's wonderful. And that is rare. But most wow. people say, you know what? Fuck it. I'll sell 
right? I line my pockets and who cares about anybody else? There's none of that kind of uh, sense of, um, sense of uh, um, responsibility, right? For your fellow, fellow human being. All right. So that's, that was, that's, that was, that's what that, I hope, I hope that kind of, kind of rings a bell and kind of brings it all into check. Right. When I'm saying, right. It, talking about this, it's uh, there's a context and hopefully that paints the context. So uh, that was honesty and sincerity. And now we move on to that's five. Number six is honor and honor is this, Though Bushido deals with the profession of soldiering, is equally concerned with non-martial behavior. The sense of honor, a vivid consciousness of personal dignity and worth characterizes the samurai. He was born and bred to value the duties and privileges of his profession. Fear of disgrace hung like a sword over the head of every samurai. To take offense at slight provocation was ridiculed as short-tempered. As a popular adage put it, True patience means bearing the unbearable. All right. So, so you know, patience. You know, earlier on, we talked about you know um, where everyone's got a three-minute self-gratification, instant gratification mindset um, because life is convenient, man. Life is comfortable, right? You know, we've never been in a better situation where we can get stuff like that. You know, Amazon Prime, brilliant, right? I'm not faulting any of these comforts, right? They're wonderful, right? But everything has its time and place, right? And we've we've almost lost that, okay? Uh, our um, our newer generations, I've got kids that are teenagers. Guess what? They want everything now. Why? Because the society they've been brought up in is instant gratification society. It's not their fault. So it's up to us as parents to teach them about patience. So the conversation about patience is 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 a common uh, conversation that needs to be had because when you're younger you know you're more energetic you 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 want to go out you want to get it and uh, and uh, and you want to get it now um, but not everything happens straight away you know you sow a seed right um, and the seed is not going to grow instantly as they say the harvest is not in the same season as the sowing it takes time especially if it's something that's valuable and worth it is you have to uh, have an investment in that that's going to take some effort and energy to kind of nurture and nourish that and our honor, funnily enough, is actually talking about that, that thing, uh, about taking your time, having dignity when you're doing things uh, and having worth about doing things. Um, and, um, you know, that means that means when you're when you're doing something, there's a different mindset to the way you approach things. Right. Uh, and uh, temper doesn't come into it. Because you see, when you start to learn the art of patience, then temper has to has to uh, retreat. Okay, has to, right? But when temper comes in, there is no patience. Patience disappears completely. All right. So this is going to be one or the other. So you have to learn that. Uh, and the best thing, best way I can say to you know to kind of what I say, temper your temper so that you can cultivate the art of honor, is um, is f- first of all. Um, learn to fast and i can tell you why because a lot of people and you've all heard the term hangry you know people get hungry i used to get hangry man right my wife used to be like oh he's 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 hungry right and then obviously later on later on you know we realized that you know when people are hungry you get angry and therefore um therefore um uh, the the coinage of the word hangry came about now let me just put something in context this is very primal right it's very kind of be a basic kind of lowest level, um, you know, uh, primal instinct happening here. If you're hungry, right, technically you shouldn't have energy, right, to do anything. But we get, you know, men in general, I mean, obviously women is some women as well, but a lot of men I've realized as a, as in uh, rather than women get angry, right, uh, or hangry uh, when they're hungry. And uh, I think the reason for that is, is, um, uh, our primal beings is there. Right, it's time to go out to go hunt and get 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 you bring in your next next kill or go out and you know go cultivate some some crops to bring some food back in. Right now, if that's the case, then if you're hungry and you're basically de- depleted of energy, all of a sudden you get angry. Now you've got this whole adrenaline rush and you've got this kind of whole 
turbo boost of energy going into so you can go out and actually do that uh, task that you need to do to, to bring, bring some, and put some food on the table. So I think it's all related to that. Um, so I think it's our primal being kicking in. When you fast, right, you are curbing all of that. You have to learn to battle with that and overcome and defeat the impatience and the, and the temper that you have with, with your hunger inside and potentially your thirst, right? That, you know, you need to eat something, otherwise you're going to die or you're going to, you know, do something that's going to, you know, um, you're going to regret but out of temper, right? And you have to overcome that. You have to defeat it. So fasting, well, that'll be the first thing it teaches you. Now you need to do that for a goddamn year at least, right? And if you do it uh, the way I I'm not it, fasting for in for the whole year, that's not what lax means. <laughs> yeah, so this is what I was gonna say. The way I did it as an example was I I did um uh I used to have my Friday dinner, so eat normally on Friday, and after the Friday dinner, not eat anything until the Saturday dinner meal. Mm-hmm. Right. So my next meal would be a Saturday dinner. So mm-hmm. have my Friday dinner. Right. And then not eat anything all the way up to the Saturday dinner. Right. So you're basically fasting from, um, let's say, let's say my last my la- Friday meal was six o'clock. So from, say, seven to seven the next day, or even four the next day, if you wanted to eat a bit earlier, you can, you can then slowly start, start to extend it and not have anything. And that was enough. That was enough to teach me that actually, you know what? I am no longer a slave to food. I don't need, uh, food doesn't run me. I run the food, right? And, and I take on that, that fuel, that energy, um, that, that, that light fuel when I need it. Um, and, uh, and I don't need to act like an animal, like a, like a wild animal that's kind of, you know, um, uh, being threatened in the meantime, right? And all of a sudden, everything changed, right? Mm-hmm. Everything became calm, right? But I had to battle that for a year, all right? So, um, so and there's a whole bunch of other, you know, uh, intermittent fasting and this and that and so on. You don't, you know, again, each to each to their own, but I can tell you this worked for me and I would uh, encourage a- a- everybody to do that. Let's say if you don't eat for a day, right? Um, Unless you've got a pre-existing medical condition or something, in which case refer to your physician or doctor, right? Otherwise, if you're in good health and there's no issues, then I don't see any reason why you can't practice that, right? But like I said, if you've got a pre-existing condition or any kind of contraindication to fasting, you need to consult the relevant physician and doctor before you go and do anything like this, okay? Um, But for most people that are healthy and fit, uh, you know, I'm sure you can survive without food for a day. Um, I drank water throughout the day, right? Uh, and trust me, you can get sick of tired of drinking water as well very quickly. Um, but after a while, you don't even need to drink much as well, right? Um, and there's a there's a beautiful uh, uh, drawing that I saw a while ago where it showed um, showed a, a picture of the same being uh, when they were in a lower state of vibration. They were eating food and um, and material fuel right and then uh, then they then they had a smaller portion uh, of food and you could see this light start to connect uh, coming out outside of them then they went on to water where the light, light started to go even higher and then they went on to nothing where the light connected to source right so actually uh, you may have heard of um, people called brethens. Brethens are people that don't eat or drink anything um, for up to a month or even longer at a time and this is no lie. I have got a very good friend of mine. He's a breath and she does not eat or drink anything for a month at a time. And she's perfectly healthy, right? You wouldn't even, you wouldn't even know, right? Uh, and there are people like that that do that. Why? Because they actually feed off cosmic energy. Now, if you think about it, uh, all, all, everything that we eat is light, okay? But what if you could, what if you could, what if you could eat, um, uh, should I say, um, be fueled up? on the light from the source itself. Now, uh, the reason I, I say everything is light is if everything is a vibratory, vibratory particle, 
right? That vibratory particle is just energy that's oscillating, right? Which we often refer to as sound or light. It's all part of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So if you collectively refer to that as light, it's everything is light. Uh, all of our crops grow through light, right? Photosynthesis. Everything we eat is a consequence of a photosynthesis-derived process, right? Our product output, should I say, right? So where plants, plants are given to the animals, animals consume that, they grow, we eat the meat, right? Or uh, same thing with fish, you know, they feed on algae, algae grows because of photosynthesis, because of the light and so on. Everything comes from the light. This is why the sun is referred as God, right? In many cultures, right? Why? Because that light is uh, the, 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 the source for this photosynthesis process that produces the material uh, foods that we consume, right? But what if you could just, just consume light directly? So this concept is not alien if you start to put it into context that way and you think, actually, well, you know what? Fucking cut out the middle, man. Cut out all the material bullshit, right? Uh, just go straight to the light. Eat the light itself, right? And then you're tapped into the source. You don't need anything else. But that ain't going to come for free. You need to do a hell of a lot of work to get there, right? And, um, you know, I'm still working on it as well. And I can, I can uh, fast if I want to. I've done a, a three-day fast. And that was hard. I've got to admit, it was hard, right? And all I did, all I did was drink water. And it was really hard. Right. Um, but you've got to train your body slowly, slowly, slowly. And doing something like a three day fast is not a light undertaking. So, again, if you've got a pre existing condition or anything like that, you need to speak to that your doctor or physician before you go and try any of this stuff. Right. And if you start to, you know, self diagnose, self, self, uh, self, uh, um, write your own kind of a fasting program and so on, um, you know, consult some specialists that have been in that space and understand what's going to happen to you. Right. Because it takes a lot of time for you to adapt, you know, and the reason, the way this is happening is just like, you know, if you were uh, trying to become a bodybuilder, you need to train your muscles. Uh, you need to train your body to first of all start the exercises. Your body adapts, and then it starts to go through a stage of um, uh, development around that. Okay, and it takes years, right? You don't just become a bodybuilder overnight. And let's just say you're not you're not taking any stimulants and supplements that are kind of speed up the process. Let's say you're doing it all naturally. It takes time, right? It takes years, right? So this could take you years as well. Um, but I just wanted to kind of bring that into context. Okay. Um, because it's important that people don't go out there and start doing these crazy diets uh, and fasting and then, uh, start to struggle because, um, you'll, you'll have mis mis misconstrued everything that I've just said. So, you know, um, this is, this shows about raising human consciousness and raising wisdom. So be wise, you know, when you do anything, um, and uh, take the necessary, uh, precautions and do the necessary due diligence. Right. Yeah, definitely get support. Make sure you have someone at hand. Uh, don't do anything without knowing anything about it. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And baby steps, guys, baby steps. You know, you need to learn how to how to uh, crawl uh, if you can stand up. Then you can learn how to walk before you can run. Then when you can run, you can start to run faster and so on. So, you know, gradually, 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 gradually is always a key. And again, uh, gradually for the impatient person is an impossibility, right? But you have to make that impossibility to I'm a possibility. All right. Mm. Um, so you need to flip the script on that. Uh, number seven is loyalty. Okay. So this is number seven of the Bushido code. Uh, so this says economic reality has dealt a blow to organization loyalty around the world. Nonetheless, true humans remain loyal to those to whom they are indebted. Loyalty to a superior was the most distinctive virtue of the feudal era. Personal fidelity exists among all sorts of humans. A gang of pickpockets swears allegiance to its leader, but only in the code of chivalrous honor does loyalty assume paramount importance. Okay. So again, honor and loyalty have to go hand in hand. All right. And this doesn't mean you become a slave to, to greed. You become a slave to money. You become a slave to whoever's kind of lining your pockets, whoever's, wherever the, the source of the, the, the money is coming from. Uh, loyalty is far greater than that. Okay. So you've got to have honor 
with that, right? So again, Honor was talking about uh, not being driven by greed and money and almost having a a, a, a kind of a grudge towards money in the um, Bishida Code. Um, so having that and remaining loyal um, with the abstinence of um, monetary gain, right? As they say, you know, if you do things where, if you do things with an open heart, uh, you do things with an abundance. Abund- you will attract abundance, right? <clears throat> so you do things um, selflessly, you will attract more things to the self. Okay. Uh, so if I was to rephrase that, if you do things selflessly, we will attract things more. Uh, you'll attract self more. Okay. <laughs> 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 That's gonna take a few for people to a few moments for for that to sink in with a few people. <laughs> if you do things selflessly, you will uh, attract self more. Let's put that. <laughs> All right. So uh, yeah, just something to kind of uh, just um, you know chew on that and digest. Uh, and you know, loyal loyalty loyalty shouldn't have strings. Uh, a really mm. uh, close friend of mine once once taught me, you know, um, a friendship. Friendship without pressure, right? Friendship we should come up without pressure. Uh, in other words, uh, you know, we've all got a friend that you know. We say, oh, you know, you meet them and they say, oh, you know, why, why haven't you called me? Why haven't you? Why haven't you arranged to meet me? Well, it's like I'm here, dude. I'm right here, right now, right? Or you call a friend and they're like, oh, well, let's arrange to meet up. Well, I'm on the phone to you right now. Let's arrange it now, then. You know, uh, and, and it's just. I, just awkward pressure or, you know, with certain people. And uh, I don't do that because they're not real friends. So I don't keep those people around me anymore. Um, but when I was younger, I didn't know the difference. I didn't have clarity around that. So these people kept confusing me um, through a manipulation, through guilt and so on. That's not loyalty. A loyalty is, is absent of all of that bullshit. Yeah, because that's all it is, right? It just messes with your head, right? And uh, it leaves you um, uh, in a bit of a, a bit of a spin. And if you feel like somebody's spinning you out, then you need to understand why. Okay, loyalty is when you do something from the heart, from the core, because you want to, not because you have to. Because you want to, not because someone's manipulating you to do so. But you want to, not out of obligation, because you feel that that's the right. That's what you think you need to do because, you know, you, you know, they did something for you and it's a tip for tat situation or whatever the circumstances for might be because tip for tat, again, you're in a transactional society, right? Your transactional mindset, right? You have, if, you know, if, if you do this, they're going to do this. And if they've done that, then you're going to do this and so on. That's rubbish, man. That doesn't take you anywhere, right? Do things selflessly. Again, that benevolence comes back in because you start realizing, actually, if you do things with benevolence and mercy, you do things without expecting anything in return, things will come anyway. And then you you can accept it with open arms because when you're willing to give things openly with an open heart, guess what? You have to learn how to receive with an open heart as well, because you will receive. And it, you know, a lot of people don't want anything returned, so they will reject that. You need to learn to actually embrace that, because when you give open, again, I'll repeat, when you give with an open heart, you also will receive with an open heart in abundance, okay? Um, and things change. You'll be amazed how, how well this works, but you've got to shift your energy Right. And you got to, and your mindset is just a gateway to shifting your energy. Right. So, so just, just kind of keep that in mind. And then, uh, um, then the last point is number eight, uh, which was character and self control. So, Bushido teaches that humans should behave accordingly to an absolute moral standard, um, one that transcends logic. What's right is right, and what's wrong is wrong. The difference between good and bad and between right and wrong are givens, not arguments subject to discussion or justification. And a human should know the difference. Finally, it's a human's obligation to teach his children moral standards through the model of his own behavior. The first objective of samurai education was to build up character. The the subtler faculties of prudence, intelligence, and dialectics were less important. Intellectual superiority was esteemed, but a samurai was essentially a man of no action, a man of action, sorry. 
Uh, I'll repeat that again. But a samurai was essentially a man of action. No historian would argue that Hideyoshi personified the eight virtues of Bushido throughout his life. Like many great humans, deep faults paralleled his towering gifts. Yet by choosing compassion over confrontation and benevolence over belligerence, he demonstrated ageless qualities of humanity. Today, his lessons could not be more timely, especially in corporate battlefield. Mm. So character and self-control. So this is ultimately what you're cultivating is your character and self-control. Self-mastery is about mastering your body, your mind, your emotions, your spirit. Okay. Uh, and that takes time. Right. And that's the end result is you get to that point where you can transcend yourself. All right. All right. You're not transcending anybody else. It's a bit like golf. You know, when you play golf, right. The only com competitor is you, right. It doesn't matter who else you're playing. All you can do is control how you play. Right. And that is it. It's just you against yourself. It always was. So um, uh, you just need to kind of learn to, you know, uh, decrease your handicap. <laughs> wow. That's, that's insane, man. I mean, like we were talking about martial arts. We actually did a bit of martial mind power today. We, we kind of just went free flow with this whole conversation. And we ended up talking about, you know, the, these um, human principles that are the undertone. I mean, we've spoken about so many things today about, you know, um, getting from point A to B the fastest, you know, about making your strong side stronger, right? About, um, you know, having no limitations on what you're doing and how you have interactions with everybody in your workplace and how having honor, respect, loyalty can be such a powerful thing in the workplace. You know, there's so much stuff we've sp spoken about, emotions, managing your emotions, because if you don't have control of your emotions, you can go pear-shaped. Right. So that is you know, a very powerful thing to do, um, especially in the corporate world, you know, being able to monitor that and how, you know, sharing on fasting is a good tool or practice to, you know, even be able to get some discipline over your hungriness. <laughs> right? And um, it, it's just been fasc fascinating how we've gone into such a deep realm um, with this topic. And we've, we've spoken about different martial arts, different backgrounds and the similarities between all of them. Right. And at the end of the day, it all boils down to human communication and how you're being as a hu human being. Right. Um, there's nothing greater than that. Right. And that's what we're here. I mean, this, this planet is there's nothing without us, without people. And yet people cause so much pain and suffering for each other. Um, but they're causing it on themselves at the same time. Right. And if you go into any situation or scenario, you'll see that when we don't have mastery over these things, there's disruption in our lives in many different places, business and life. So it's good to become aware of these things. That's what we're hoping with this whole, all this kind of thing is just to drop something in there, something that you can have a little think about and think, hang on a minute, how does that apply to me? Because as Lax was saying, it's about you in relation to everything around you. You're not separate from this. We're part of this whole kind of dynamic going on in what in, in this kind of weird matrix that's connected, right? So it's in relation, how are you responding in relation to what's going on? So there's a two-way thing going on. It's not just you. It's not just about them. It's about we as a, as a kind of collective, right? So like I said, this has been deep, man. This has been fascinating. Then in, any kind of last words before we sign off? Because this has been a, a longer one than usual, but very, very good. Yeah, my closing statement is going to be, I think there's a, a lot of injustice to pairs, by the way. Because... <laughs> 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 you know, you know poor pairs i mean what have they done right why why are pairs associated with things going bad you know <laughs> pear shape a bad shape you know then you compare the pear to an apple right <laughs> so your you know, pear shape why is an apple <laughs> superior to a pear you know is it the, exactly was it the apple that started this i want to know i want to know <laughs> <laughs> it must be man the apple is the culprit <laughs> i'm sure there's a i'm sure there's a again uh a, 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 you know <laughs> colloquial story behind this which uh, yeah. which i'm gonna google after this because i want to know but uh yeah it's quite interesting isn't it <laughs> <laughs> well, there you have it there you have it but yeah jt man thanks man this has been a bit amazing man um uh, again like you said you know just freestyled it and 
whatever needs to come out comes out uh, in these uh, podcasts. And uh, um, so I hope this has been a value uh, to our listeners and viewers. And uh, I hope even if you could take one little thing away from this and it enriches your lives and leaves a positive imprint on your body, mind, emotion, spirit, uh, then uh, this whole podcast is worth, worth, worth the time. And um, so, you know, if you like it, please, uh, please share it with uh, your loved ones and, you know, help, uh, help spread the message. Cause ultimately um, raising consciousness is not something that one person can do on their own. Uh, no matter, uh, you know, how wise and enlightened they might be. Um, it's, it ne- it's something that needs to be spread so that we can all rise together. And that's what it's going to take where we are right now. We all need to rise together uh, and um, we'll do it hand in hand, uh, energetically speaking, right. Um, and, and lift one another up. And uh, as I say, the only time you should be looking down on someone is when you're extending a hand out to lift them back up. And that's that's what this is all about. So let's do that, all right? And if you think, think somebody's going to benefit from this, share it with them. And if you think somebody's uh, not going to benefit with them, then uh, benefit from this and share it with them, <laughs> all right? All right? So uh, um, uh, spread the message, spread the love, and you know we'll continue to do our bit to, um, to hopefully... Um, uh, drop wisdom bombs and uh, um, help help make the world a better place to live in. Wow, fantastic. Thank you, Sifu Loy. And remember, everyone, to check out martialmindpower.com just to get the latest information, find out about all the books, uh, check out the YouTube channel, um, and just, yeah, just keep plugging in. So until next time, thank you very much.